This morning's scripture is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God. Thank you, Julie. Jesus is for you. She thought you did a great job. That's good. That deserves a clap because that's a lot of scripture to read, wasn't it? Well, welcome to church today. We're in the middle of a series called Stained Glass Story, and what we're doing is we're using stained glass that exists in the church to tell the story of God. We've already been through the creation story. We've, we've been through the fall of humanity story, and we're skipping ahead because there's lots of things that happen, but that's just this, the, the nature of what we're doing. You can only hit so many stories. So we've got other pieces of stained glass like Noah's Ark that we're not covering. We've got the family story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and boy, if you want a story with great family drama and you're worried about your family because you've got a lot of family drama, go read that story and you might feel better about yourself. But God used those people and that family to bring about the Israelite people. Uh, we're missing the, the story of, there's a piece of stained glass that has a, a burning bush, which is how Moses was called into ministry. He saw this plant that was it covered in flames, and it wouldn't be consumed by the flames, and that was how God called him to be a leader for the Israelite people. Uh, but today, we, we have what, I, it can be maybe an uninspiring scripture. It's just a list of things that you can't do. Uh, we're using, or this is the stained glass piece that we have, if we can put that up there. Uh, it's just a picture of two stone tablets, you know. I don't know if that gets you jazzed up this morning and ready to go. But I do think it is convenient to talk about the Ten Commandments this week, especially because there has been some chatter about the Ten Commandments in the news re late recently. Uh, the state of Louisi Louisiana approved to or, or mandated you have to have the Ten Commandments posted in all schools and in universities. And hey, in, in, as a pastor, I got to tell you, any time the government starts doing stuff with religion, I get nervous just because I think it's outside their scope and it's not their competency. This is not their area of expertise. And, and I don't think just because you post something guarantees adherence to it or proper teaching. The whole thing actually kind of reminds me of, there's this old chief's coach. His name was Romeo Crennel, and he was a coach 10 years ago. You are their chief super fans. This is uh, Nancy Hoffman and John. They, so you know, you live through these dark times. 
And Romeo Cornell is actually a very accomplished coach. He, he's a brilliant football mind. He won multiple Super Bowls with the New England Patriots as a defensive coordinator. And then probably maybe, I don't know how many he won. How many did he win? So tons of Super Bowls. Anyway, he, he came on staff to be the head coach for the Kansas City Chiefs, and he was only coached for one year, and the year did not go well. So they lost their first several games, and in the middle of that, that losing streak, he decided that he would put a sign in the hallway. So whenever they walked from the locker room to the field, they would see the sign. And the sign said, eliminate bad football. So the hope was, as the team would walk by the sign, they would see it, and they would begin to be more focused, and they would stop making mistakes on the field. Well, it didn't happen. The team lost the next several games. So then the coach changed tactics, and he took that sign down, and he put up a new sign. And the new sign said, do you remember this? I don't know why I remember this. My wife says I remember the most stupid sports things, but <laughs> it's who I am. The new sign said, play good football. So they walked by that sign, and they lost their next several games. I think the team only won like two, two games that whole year, and he was let go after that. So the point is, here's the point. Simply post something doesn't, posting something doesn't mean anything changes. You have to have good coaching. And you have to have good teaching to go along with it. I think the best place to learn about the Ten Commandments would be in a Jewish synagogue or in a church like this because this is our area of expertise. This is what we know. So that's what we're going to talk about today is the Ten Commandments. So the whole story opens in, it's in Genesis or Exodus 20. And God speaks these words. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We sang a song moments ago. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That is a, that's a response, in, in my opinion, to the Exodus story. The Israelites were in the land of Egypt. They cried out to God. They were suffering the oppressive weight of slavery. God heard them and God answered by bringing them out of slavery. So we sang, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered, that's why I trust him. So this statement that, we, that God says here, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, that's a statement of, hey, this is a God that we can trust. This is a God who has our interest in mind. So from there, because of what God has done for us, we might want to listen in to what God has to say. So God gives the Ten Commandments after that. And the first couple commandments uh, are, are kind of linked together. So you have the first one, you shall have no other God before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol on heaven or on earth or in the waters below. So in ancient times, the reason why this was important, in ancient times, people believed in many gods. It was a polytheist culture, meaning many, many gods. And so even the Israelites would have believed in other gods, but they would have said that our God is the one true God. Our God is the one that is more powerful than any other God. That's why we elevate God to that supreme status. And then it also says you shouldn't make an idol. So uh, you think about our modern times. We may not believe in many gods. That's not so popular in the day and age we live in, but we can easily make idols. The idol can be ourselves. It can be money, success, a nation. It can be a flag of some sorts. It can be some identity. Uh, but we don't elevate anything else in our life above that of God. Our primary identity is in what? It's in Christ. And so that's what it's talking about. You put God first in your life. The third one uh, commandment, do not take the Lord's name in vain. When I was a young child, I always believed that this was the commandment, that if I hit myself on the thumb with a hammer, I better not blurt out, oh my, right? Don't say that. And, and Listen, I believe that when we utter the name of God, there should be some reverence and respect on our, on our lips and, and from our mouth. So don't use that term lightly. But I've now come to understand that it means so much more than just, just that alone. I, um, it's, it's more about misrepresenting the name of God, using the name of God for your own personal gain or, or your own personal vanity. So just think about all the people who have done awful, horrible things in God's name. Things like uh, killed others, started wars, they've oppressed people, they have lied, cheated, and extorted, and they've, uh, they've used God to do it, to justify their behavior. When we do those things, we're using and taking the name of God in vain. Does that make sense? 
The fourth one is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I, I feel like we need this one more than anything else because our world is so busy all of the time. Don't you feel like you get pulled in a hundred directions and you're not always sure which one to go? And then if you do choose one, you're always disappointing someone else. And so it's like my ability to produce becomes my identity and who I am. And God says we're not human doings, we're human beings, so we can just be. God even tells us to rest the livestock in this passage. Give your livestock rest. I love that. Like there's care and concern for that, for all of creation. So our identity is not in how productive we are, but it's in the Creator. So those first four commandments, they really have to do with our relationship uh, to God. So it's between us and God. And then the rest of them have to do with how we relate to God and neighbor or God and other people. And it's stuff like this, honor your father and mother, which is, is, is a great thing to do, uh, but it can be really tricky, right? Especially if you have a tenuous relationship with your parents or your parents were abusive or Whatever happened between you and your parents, I think one of the best ways we can honor our parents is, is by breaking that cycle. Whatever it is that was maybe unhealthy that your parents taught you or if, they, if there was abuse there, breaking that cycle is a way to honor them. Uh, d- uh, number six is do not murder. Uh, then the next one, do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear fa- wi- false witness against your neighbor. This is number nine. I wonder how often we talk about other people and we don't have all of the information, and we step to a judgment or conclusion. So it's the, God is telling us, don't do that. Uh, by the way, in our stained glass, if we can put it back up here, this is a, a, a fun trivia fact for you. Do you notice anything missing from the stained glass? We actually don't have the, the ninth commandment on there. So I think it was just an oversight when the art was created, but you have the, the tablet that is tucked behind You've got six, seven, eight, and then there's no nine. So that's my assumption at least. So I, I guess what that means is you can just, you can lie about each other all you want, just make up stories. <laughs> and then the tenth one, tenth one is do not want what your neighbor has. Do not covet. So don't get caught up in this comparison trap. Don't get caught up in acquiring more. Be grateful for what you have and really seek to want God alone as the fulfillment of all your needs. So if you really, though, want to understand the, the law, it just begins at the Ten Commandments. It goes on from there. So the Ten Commandments are given to Moses when he is on Mount Sinai. And he, God gives the first ten to Moses and then gives him more and more commands if you read on. So we're in chapter 20, but if you go in, into the chapters that follow, it gives you all sorts of instructions and laws and uh, ways to live. So... The more important thing to to understand when it comes to reading the law is not what each specific law says, but it's the spirit in which it was given. Because if we know that, it helps us to interpret the law and embody it in our own lives. There's some misconceptions when we think of law. You and I, when we use the word law, I automatically jump to, in in our culture, it is, hey, there's been a rule that is established, and if I break that rule, I suffer what? The consequences. And I will be punished according to my crime. And that's, you see some of that in here. You also see a lot of fear. There was this one section that it, I, when Julie read it, I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. But it says, I will punish, or I punish children for their parents' sins. Did you catch that? That made me kind of like, ah. Oh. I punish children for their parents' sins. So you get some of this cause and effect. There's fear there. Uh, In verse 18, if you kept reading in the story, after all the law was given, God says this, when all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the horn and the mountain smoking, the people shook with fear and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. So the people who were there really did have this this fear of of God because God is all-powerful. And also when we think of the law, we think of it being very burdensome. You've probably heard some sermons where they talk about all of the laws that are listed out in the Old Testament, and if you add them up, there's 613 laws. Have you heard this before? And how on earth can we maintain all of these laws and uphold all of them? The weight is too much to bear. It's like God set the system up to then destroy us because God knew He would fail at it, which sounds kind of sadistic in a way, doesn't it? 
But if you truly want to understand the law, you have to understand the way and the spirit in which it was given. The law was given to the Israelite people in a time of need. Think about it. They had just fled from the land of Egypt. They had no way, no clue uh, how they were going to live together. No system of government, no way to organize themselves. God calls them to the mountain, and there God gives them the law and says, uh, gives them the Ten Commandments, guidelines in which they could build a functioning society. It provided a moral framework for them. How are we going to live life together? So in that sense, the giving of the Ten Commandments was this very practical tool, application of their faith. God said, follow me. You can trust me. I led you out of Egypt. I gave you freedom. I liberated you. I brought you to this place. If you follow me, you can trust me that I have your best interest in mind. And it's more than just practical, though. When we say the law, the Hebrew word for that is Torah. Can everybody say that? Torah. And it means the law, and it's the first five books of the Bible. So it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's all those 613 laws that are listed in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So if you're reading those books and you find yourself falling asleep, then you, you know why, because you're reading these 613 commandments. And it's more than practical because the, the Torah, which we translate as law in English, a more appropriate translation would be things like, words like teaching or instruction or direction. This week I was being, I was really nerding out, and I got my Bible concordance. It's like a book that's this thick out. And it lets you look up the Greek words and the Hebrew words. And you can do this online. There's websites that will do it much faster, but I got my book out for whatever reason. And I found this great passage in it that talked about the Torah. Here's what it said. It says, the Torah is not a restriction or hindrance, but instead the means whereby one can reach a goal or ideal. And in the truest sense, Torah was given to Israel to enable her to truly become and remain God's special people. In other words, if we live according to the law that is spelled out in the Torah, the teaching, the instruction, the direction, then we will fulfill what God has for us. Now, we will not be able to keep all the law ourselves. We've, we've done that experiment before. We tried that. We can read about it in the... In the the Hebrew Bible. And in fact, if you just go a little bit forward in the story, whenever Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the law from God, the people grew tired of waiting. And so before Moses even had a chance to come back to them and teach them the law, they had already made a golden calf for themselves and started worshiping it. And it gets worse from there because then Moses becomes so enraged that he decides he's going to take the Ten Commandments and he throws them down on the ground and he breaks them which I find hysterical. And he has to go get new ones. I'm not making this up. This is part of the story. So the point is, it, the law is not about, and it's never been about achieving perfection and fulfilling them all in their, in their complete reality. The law is to give us a direction. It's to set a course for our lives. It's like a roadmap. If you look at the Ten Commandment picture, I'm going to put that back up here. Look at this uh, picture. There's a, there's a subtle piece of this glass that we didn't talk about before. Does anyone notice it? What's going on? It's not just the two tablets. What else is there? There's a what? A plant. There's a plant, a vine. Yeah, okay, I couldn't. There's a, a vine, a plant. It's, look, what, look at what's happening. It's growing out from the base of those two tablets. And the point is, is with the law, there is growth, there is vitality, there is life. The point of the law has always been to lead people to life. Not condemn, not destroy, but put people on a path in which they can live their lives. Psalms or uh, Proverbs 13, 14 says the teaching, which is our, another way to interpret or the law. Another word for it. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life so that one may avoid the snares of death. The law was given to people so that they wouldn't 
find themselves entrapped in things that lead to, to their own death. The law is God extending grace to people, saying, here, please, live in this way, and if you do so, it will be good for you and all of the people around you. It shows God's uh, desire to bring goodness to all. This is, the law is, is, is a matter of salvation and life. The reason why God tells us not to steal is not just because it's wrong and we shouldn't do it and it's bad for us. God doesn't want somebody else to have their stuff taken from them. The reason why we shouldn't kill, which again, it's, it's bad for us, is, all, is also because God doesn't want someone else to die. Because God cares about that other person. So the Ten Commandments isn't just about what you do, it's about how we live in relationship with one another. Paul in Romans says it like this. Romans 13, 8, he says, whoever loves another person has fulfilled the law. When Christ was here, Christ said, don't even begin to think that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus, when he lived and walked this earth, he was a living representation of what the law is like. So when we study his life, we see how, how to apply the law, the Ten Commandments and all the laws there uh, forth, how to fulfill that. And Jesus helped us reimagine our own understanding or a misrepresentation of those laws. And he embodied the law. He summarized it in what we call the greatest commandment. And you know the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as, as yourself. So when we hear at St. Paul's, we talk about loving like Jesus. Do you know what that means we're doing? We are literally trying to fulfill the law of God that started way back when. Isn't that cool? So if you're like me, one, one of the things that you like to do sometimes is you like to be a little bit adventurous, and you may try to do some stuff on your own from time to time. One of the things that I like to do is in, if I'm going to a new place, I will try to get there without using GPS. Does anyone ever try to do that? So people are like, oh, heck no. All that does is cause problems. You might be proving my point. I like to try to get there without help of technology because I think it does something in me. It like keeps my wits about me or something. It's a challenge. In the olden days, we used to, well, it's not even that old. We used to use MapQuest. Do you remember that? You type in, where you were going, and then, or where you were starting and where you were going, and sometimes you had trouble getting the order right, so you had to flip it. Um, and then you'd print them out and take them with you. Uh, or, or you would just have conversations with people. That's how it worked. Well, you go down by the Casey's and you take a left here, and that's what we would do. But I like to try to do it uh, on my own. It's like this little adventure that I get to go on. So it's just me and my car and my sense of direction. And it's fun for a while until, until you take a wrong turn and you make your kids late for something. <laughs> then you're like, gosh, that was stupid. But the point is, is it's helpful to have that direction in our lives. So when you have that GPS on, it gives you a sense of, of where you're going. It keeps you from taking the wrong turn. And so when I, when I do become lost, I can turn it back on and it helps me get back on track. The same is true with God's law. Returning to God's law can help put us back on a path that leads to uh, life and justice and righteousness. That's what the law does. So my question to you is this, is at what place are you at in your journey and in your life? What struggles are you currently experiencing? What fears or doubts are you holding on to? Where are their pain points do you have areas in your life where you're just holding on to a lot of anger? Is there a place where forgiveness needs to happen? How might the teachings of God be beneficial for you today, here and now in this moment? So there are many routes that you can take, and we all take many. Some of us take longer than others. I don't know what else to say about that except for some of us like the scenic route. Or some of us like to learn things the hard way. Some of us wind up on detours. We're going down a path and there's all of a sudden this road closed sign and we have to go around it. 
by no desire or wish of our own, but we're just hit with this surprising thing that happens in life. Some of us have breakdowns, and it's like we're just stuck on the side of the road, and we don't want to get up and move or don't know how to get up and move. Some of us have become so lost, we don't know which direction to turn or how to get back on path. And some of us, you know who you are, we intentionally go the wrong way. And that's been me in my life at multiple times. But hear me when I say this, no matter what, it's never too late to turn back to God who puts us on a path that leads to life. So we're going to close with a prayer. Uh, It's the beginning of Psalm 23. And I'm going to have you say this with me as we pray together. Please join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for His name's sake. Amen. the first Sunday of the month, which means we will take communion here together in just a moment. Um, And I love this connection between sacrament and communion and the reminder that Christ has done so much on our behalf, including the fulfillment of the law that came to bring us life and to show us how to live life fully. So in this moment, I encourage you to remember the promise of fulfillment of law and to remember what Jesus did for us that night. On the night in which he gave his life, he took the bread and he gave thanks to it. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to it and his disciples and he said, drink from this all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we take time to remember these mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves up in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's suffering for us as we proclaim this mystery of faith. Would you pray with me? God, I just ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them the body and the blood of Christ for us that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. Amen. So here in just a moment, as we invite people to each station, we are going to partake in communion together. For those of you worshiping at home, this is your opportunity. Grab whatever you can and join us as well and share in this moment. If you are here in person and you have not been with us before, here in just a moment, you are going to stand up and our team will guide you from your right over to your left for a station. You will be given a piece of bread. You will dip it into the cup. And if you are not comfortable with that, we have little God pods. You can grab a God pod and you can take communion that way as well. But one of my favorite things I get to tell you every time we have communion is that as United Methodists, we believe in an open table concept. What that means is that we are not the ones that decide whether or not you are communion in God, but that is your choice. And so we invite you, no matter where you're at, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you have going on in life, if you want to be in communion with God, we invite you to come forward. The table is ready. Please come.